Hey everyone, this is going to be the first of several lessons that I've put together on populations and communities. The central theme of these lessons is going to be change, change taking place over time. So with populations, it'll be changes in numbers of individuals within the population, changes in the density, changes in the genetics of a population. And when we get on to talking about communities, it's going to be a change in the community makeup, the individuals that you do find within that community over time. But this one here is going to focus on population, so we'll start off with a definition of exactly what we mean by a population. As you can see, the title here is a variation, and that's going to tie in with, of course, evolution as well. And so this is going to really deal with the change in the genetics of a population over time. If we take a look at the picture that I have at the bottom here, obviously we're taking a, a look at our species, and that is one of the keys when we're talking about population, is it is for one specific species. So we wouldn't talk about the population of all animals, it would be the population of a specific animal or species that we are referring to. We can also see from this picture, there's obviously a variation that we do have within our population. And we're going to see that that variation is going to be critically important for the process of evolution within any population. And in fact, even though the four individuals that we're taking a look at here, clearly different in terms of their visible appearance, it's now uh, fairly obvious that that truly is only skin deep. And in fact, we are very, very uniform in terms of the genetics of the human population. So yes, when we do talk about population, uh, we are usually asking a question like, what is the size of the population? So in addition to what is the species, we want to know how many there are of that particular individual. When we do ask about the size of a population, it's usually followed by what is the size of the population of the city or the country or the world. So we need to know what is the defined area or territory that we want to know the in-depth number of individuals for. And as I mentioned, this does have to do with change, and all of these are going to change over time. The number of individuals, the genetics of the population, as we'll see, they're going to change over time. So here's our definition of a population, and now we'll start to talk about something other than human populations. So in this case here, at the upper right-hand side, we see a caribou population, and in fact, this is the porcupine caribou herd, which is on the border between Yukon and Alaska. So at the top, the first bullet point, these are the four things really that I mentioned that you need to indicate whenever we're talking about a population. So it's always, yes, of course, the number of individuals within the population. So in the case of the porcupine caribou herd, we have 123,000. We're talking about one specific species, and that is the caribou that we are referring to in this example here. We are talking about a specific area, and again, that is the Yukon-Alaska border, where we do find this herd of caribou. And the numbers, they do change over time. So this is the number from 2001. If we now take a look at the graph at the bottom, this is going to show us that yes, there are some changes that are taking place. And although this isn't going to be the focus of this presentation, population numbers, that is what this graph is showing, is we do see a change that's taking place over time, the number of individuals, and this goes from the year 1970 up to about 2015. So we can see that, yes, the numbers do fluctuate. We can see it going up here, and then it goes down. We have kind of a gap in the sampling, but then it does appear to go up again here. So the most recent one, it has the number of caribou in this population, 2013, at 197,000. Many, many different reasons as to why this population, the number of individuals might change over time. But again, this presentation is going to focus more on not the numbers, but it's going to focus on the genetics and the changing genetic makeup of a population over time. So back to this word variation, uh, variation which is critically important for the process of evolution by means of natural selection. Here we're taking a look at, again, a different population, a different animal population, in this case, snails. So all of these snails, they are members of the same species. And the biological definition of a species is individuals that are able to get together, 
reproduce and produce viable offspring that they themselves can go ahead and then reproduce as well. So even though all of these snails do look different visibly, they are all members of the same species, able to interbreed and produce viable offspring. So this is kind of significant, as we'll see, for the process of evolution, is that not just within this population here of the snails, not just within the human population, that was pretty clear with this first picture, but also it may not be obvious, but out of these, well, whether it's 123,000, 197,000, or all of the caribou that we see in this picture here, there is an equal amount, and in fact, probably even more variability within this population and other wild populations than what we truly have in our population in the human population. So variation, yes, critical for evolution. And where this variation does come from is something that we have already chatted about when we talked about DNA, the structure of DNA, DNA replication, and that is mutations. Remember that when we talk about a mutation, it has a very, very specific definition in biology. And what we're talking about is a change in the base sequence in the DNA. So we can see that in this step in the ladder here, which is for this particular gene, um, we have this base pair. If we change that to a different base pair, well, this is referred to as a substitution, and that is one kind of a mutation. So really important to realize that these are, these are random mutations that do take place. So this sort of thing takes place due to exposure to different things in the environment, and mutations, mistakes do take place in the replication process itself. Remember that in terms of human DNA, on the 46 chromosomes, there are 3.2 billion of those steps. So whenever we are replicating 3.2 billion of these steps, then mistakes are going to be made. And this is really important. These are the source of all variation. The source of all variation are these mutations that are taking place. We've also seen before that mutations, sometimes they end up being positive. Sometimes they end up being negative. In fact, most of the time, a mutation like this, where we just change one base, it actually doesn't make any difference at all in terms of the eventual protein that is produced and the phenotype of that organism. So that's what we would then call a neutral mutation. And the last point that I have here, at least 1,000 different diseases in humans do arise from these different mutations. So that shouldn't be anything entirely new. A couple of other definitions that might be new though. The first one here, gene pool. So within any population, whether it is the snails, whether it's the caribou, whether it's the human population, what we can do is talk collectively about all of the different versions, all of the different alleles for all of the different uh, genes. And when we pool all of that together for an entire population, so it's, again, it's not an individual, it's not the genetic makeup of the individual, it is the gene pool collectively for that entire population. And for the human population, we're talking somewhere on the order of about seven and a half billion as of 2020. The other term here, a little bit different, polymorphism. Poly means many or at least more than two. Morphism means different forms. So these are two or more varieties of the same gene where one is not necessarily better than the other. So because there's no competition, natural selection for these genes, one is not more suited to the environment or leads to a phenotype that's more suited to the environment than the others, um, they are maintained within the population. So this picture here, this may be the case with these lizards that we're taking a look at, where we do see different phenotypes, which do result from different alleles that we do have for the particular coloration gene. And if it so turns out that one coloration doesn't provide any benefit over the other ones, then all of these would be maintained within this particular population. And that is what would then we refer to as a polymorphism. So how do populations change over time? Well, the first one isn't new to us. This is one that you have learned before. Um, evolution by means of natural selection. So this, of course, is the work of uh, this guy here, Charles Darwin. 
and also the co-developer of Evolution by Means of Natural Selection, which is Alfred Russell Wallace. The work of Charles Darwin, or at least when it was published, dates back to 1859 and the book that he published on the origin of species. It's about four or 500 pages long, but I'm going to summarize it as is often done in textbooks to four or five bullet points that we do have here. So these ones that I do have, they might appear in different orders in different sources. But uh, the first one that I do have is that what Charles Darwin did say and Alfred Russell Wallace is that within any population, there are more offspring born than can possibly survive. There are simply not enough resources available. So because we have this overproduction, what that means is that, well, all of them cannot possibly survive. I'm going to jump down to the third one. So because there are not enough resources available within the population, within that area for all of them to survive, there is a struggle to access those limited resources. There's not enough food, uh, food available. There's not enough water. There's not enough visible space that is available. So because of this, some of them are not going to be able to survive. So now which ones are going to survive this struggle for existence? Well, if we jump back up, remember that not all of the individuals are the same. There's variation within the population. There's gene variation, which leads to phenotypic variation. And some of those individuals are simply going to be better able to survive this struggle for existence. So we refer to that as the survival of the fittest. So this word here, the fittest, what it really means is it's those individuals within the population that have particular variations that allow them to act better access the resources at that particular time. So what does that mean? If they have a greater ability to access the resources, well, they're more likely to survive. If they're more likely to survive, they're more likely to reproduce. And they're, they're more likely to reproduce, they're more likely to pass that trait on to the next generation as well. So we'll take a look at a couple of pictures here. So two um, rabbits that are, in fact, members of the same species. And this is kind of a gray area because in order to be members of the same species, they do need to be able to uh, interbreed and produce viable offspring in the natural environment. So these two here, in fact, they do come from different environments. And in reality, they would never truly encounter each other. But if they were put together in an enclosure, they would reproduce, they would um, generate viable offspring. So we would then say that, yes, they are members of the same species. So the one on the left-hand side here, this is an Arctic hare. The one on the right-hand side is the Texas um, black-tailed jackrabbit. So members of the same species, very, very, very different. And these differences have a arisen through variations over long, long periods of time. So because they are exposed to different environments, this bunny rabbit here, over time, and when I say over time, we're not just talking about a few years, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years probably to generate the differences within the populations that we do see here. But if we focus that on the one on the left, so this one here, when they do reproduce, they would produce more offspring than would possibly survive. So within that population, even though most of them might look like this, there is still, again, variation within the population. So there is a struggle for survival within that population. And it's not just the availability of resources. Think about other things like predators as well. These are prey species. So if for some reason, the bunny rabbit within this environment isn't camouflaged from the predators. It's less likely to survive, which means it's less likely to go ahead and reproduce. So over time, what we do have is differences within these populations as natural selection allows them to become better and better suited to their environment as the environment is selecting for in these individuals traits that are allowing them to survive and to reproduce. Surprisingly, Charles Darwin in his book on the origin of species doesn't really talk about this here. Speciation. How do we actually get new species? So the process works something like this. So again, these two here, it's sort of a gray area because they don't really encounter each other, so they don't really reproduce. 
but if they were together, they could reproduce. So if for some reason they do remain separated for long, long periods of time going into the future, so it could be physical separation due to space. It can be geographic isolation, not just space, but there might be a body of water that's separating them. There might be a mountain range that's separating them. So because of that, not only are they physically separated, but they are reproductively separated as well. Reproductively isolated. Now they no longer get together and reproduce anymore. So as time does go on, again, all of those uh, variations they're going to accumulate over time. Mutations are going to result in differences in the genetic makeup of these populations over time. And eventually, they will become so different that even if they did come back together, they would no longer be able to reproduce. So that is when we would then say that speciation has taken place and they are now members of different species. They originally came from a common ancestor and the same species but now they have diverged into different species. That is the process of speciation. So natural selection is significantly important. We're going to talk about other ways that populations can change over time, but this is the only kind of change which is adaptive. So as time goes on, those populations become better and better adapted to their particular environmental conditions because the natural environment is selecting for those particular traits that allows those individuals to survive and to reproduce. So we already saw that there are some other mutations which are neutral. So polymorphisms within the population. So in this case here, we would have several different forms that are able to survive within the population because there is no selective advantage for those. So now the new stuff, what are some different ways that populations can change over time? Um, all of these we kind of group into what is referred to as genetic drift. So what's different about these is that it doesn't necessarily, well it doesn't in fact, lead to adaptive evolution. There's no selective pressure that is selecting for particular genotypes and phenotypes within that population, allowing them to survive and reproduce. This is the part that is kind of by chance. So going back to natural selection, mutations are chance events, but natural selection is absolutely not a chance event. The key with all of these ones that I'm going to talk about is small populations. That is going to be critically important. Things happen in small populations that we wouldn't expect to happen if we did have some larger populations. So the first one here is called random genetic drift. So loss of alleles um, during the process of meiosis and independent assortment that is taking place. So if we kind of go back to what we've already chatted about, of course, the Mendelian genetics and the genetic crosses. So let's just say that we have an incredibly small population. And if we're talking about humans only, and it's only two, all we have is one female and we have one male. So we know that this Punnett square allows us to make a prediction in terms of what we're going to get in the next generation. Remember that this is just based on probability. This may not be exactly what we do get. So there can be a chance deviation. So because humans don't have a large number of offspring, if we only have one male and a one female, it is possible that they don't have any children that actually have this genotype. So what that means is that in the next generation, what we would see is an increase in the dominant allele, and we would see a decrease in the recessive allele, because of course these always have to add up to, if there are only two alleles, 100%. So this might seem like a minor change, but this in fact is evolution that it's taking place. This is what is referred to as microevolution. So the key with this is that we do have a change that's taking place because we do have a fairly small, well, in this case, a really small population. So if we kind of make an analogy, and if we're talking about flipping coins, if we were to flip a coin, let's say six times, we wouldn't be all that incredibly um, impressed. It wouldn't be all that remarkable 
if you flip the coin six times and it lands on head six times. If we were to flip the coin 60 times and it landed on heads 60 times in a row, that would be fairly remarkable. So we wouldn't be, again, all that impressed. It's not that all, remar all that remarkable if these two parents don't have a child, which is homozygous recessive. But if we're talking about larger populations, if we're talking about a population of humans where there are hundreds of thousands, then that's not the sort of thing that we would expect. So again, the focus here is really going to be on small populations. So a few other pictures that we'll take a look at with genetic drift. So again, this is a random change in, and what we're really dealing with are the different alleles for a particular gene within the population, and the proportion, the percentage, or the frequency is what we talk about within the population. This one here, in fact, is showing a very specific kind of genetic drift, which is called the founder effect, and we'll come back and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But what they're showing, first of all, is we have a sampling of the original population, and we'll just say that this, well, at least is a larger population. So we do have variability. If we just take a look at the colors of the beetles here, we can see that there is the gray and that there is the yellow and that there is the reddish color that we do see. Large population does typically mean we have a larger genetic variability within the population as well. If we take a look at these two other populations here, labeled as A and B, they're now smaller populations that were separated from the larger population. So where we do have smaller populations, notice that first of all, we do have less variability within that population. And if these two populations were to go ahead and reproduce independently of each other, we've already lost some of the alleles, some of the genetic information from the larger population. So now even these ones here at the right hand side, even though they might once again acquire these larger numbers or reach larger numbers, we don't have the same genetic variability as what we saw in the original population. So this is one form of genetic drift. And again, we're kind of taking a look at smaller populations here. This is kind of a classic example of genetic drift that is taking place, random genetic drift that is taking place within the population of flowers that we do have here. So if we start on the left-hand side with generation number one, what we have are 10 different flowers, if you count them all up. And remember that these flowers, just like our cells, they have diploid cells, two copies of each chromosome. And so we represent that with the letters that we do have here. So if we were to count up the 10 individuals, and of course 10 times 2 means that we have 20 different alleles within this population. And if we count all of the capital R's, R's what we'll find is that there are 14 out of 20 that are the capital R, and that the remaining 6 out of 20 are the lowercase r. So if we do that math, this 14 out of 20 works out to the 0 0.7, or if you want to think in terms of percentages, 70% of the alleles within this original population are the capital R, which means the remainder have to be 30%, and that's the lowercase r. So what could happen with this population? So again, I really want to stress that strange things happen with small populations, and this is not what would necessarily happen with a larger population. All of this is by chance. So what they're showing is that within this population, what we do have is a number of them that for some reason, they're not passing their genetic information on to the next generation. And again, this is totally by chance. So what they're saying is that the only ones that are passing the genetic information on are the ones that are highlighted in these white boxes. What happened to the other flowers? Why are they not passing their traits on to the next generation? Maybe there was a landslide, which just happened to go through and wipe out all of these. They're unable to reproduce. Maybe there was a hiker that was going through this area that stepped on these plants. They're no longer able to reproduce. Maybe there's a herbivore that came along and ate these ones. They're no longer able to reproduce. So the only ones passing their genes on are the ones in the white boxes. So now if we jump ahead, it's only half of the population passing their traits on. So now if we take a look at the genetic makeup of the next population, do the same thing, count the capital and lowercase r's, what we'll see is that there's been a change. 
And now what we have is a 50-50 breakdown. 50% of them are now the capital R and 50% of them are the lowercase r. Why did this happen? It's not because for some reason the capital R's weren't as beneficial to these flowers and the lowercase r gave them some sort of selective advantage. It was just entirely by chance. It was just the luck of the draw, the ones that got stepped on, the ones that were in the way of the landslide. They were really just in the wrong place at the wrong time. By chance, the other ones got to reproduce. So because we have seen the change in the allele frequency over time, that is microevolution. And then if we continue on to the next generation, what we see here is now it's only these two out of the 10 that are able to pass their trade on to the next generation. And it just so happens there are no lowercase r's, so we've completely lost the lowercase r's from this population. And this is what is referred to as fixation. So this sort of thing, again, we wouldn't expect in a larger population, but this is the kind of thing that can happen, this random genetic drift completely changing the genetic makeup in a very short period of time for this particular population of flowers. This one here is the bottleneck effect, and we'll see that it's similar in some ways to what we just saw in the sense that we're going to end up with a small population and what's going to happen with this small population. So in the case of the bottleneck effect, the key here is what we do have is a mass die-off. So if we take a look at our original population here, we have not only a large number if we take a look at the beads, the beads are representing individuals within the population. We have a large number of individuals in the population. Take a look at all the different colors. Those different colors are the variety. So we also have a large variety within the population as well. So whatever this different trait is, that is what the color is representing. So we have the red version, we have the green version, the blue version, the yellow version, the purple version large population size and large variety within the population. Then something happens, some sort of catastrophic event happens where just about all of the individuals within that population, they are randomly and indiscriminately um, dying. And what's left over are just the chance survivors. So again, it could be something like a landslide, and it might just happen to be that these ones just were a meter out of the way of the landslide. That's why they survived. It's not that they were smarter. It's not that they were faster. They just happened to be in the right place, and they are the chance survivors. All of the other ones end up dying. So not only do we have a much, much smaller population, and again, that's gonna be kind of the key from this point on, we have a smaller population, but take a look at the colors. We have also lost a huge amount of variety within that population. So now we may get those population numbers that do go up again. We might once again get a large number in terms of the number of individuals, but we lost a great deal of that variability compared to what we saw in the original population. This, in fact, is what we think happened to the human population going back maybe 70 or 80,000 years ago, we believe that there was a bottleneck effect. And evidence does indicate that maybe the human population was down to 10,000 individuals. And that's why we say that within the human population today, we in fact have very, very low genetic variability compared to many other populations. Let's take a look at a few other kind of classic examples of the bottleneck effect. So what are some other things that can lead to these catastrophic changes that lead to the death of a huge portion of the population? Well, it could be fires, extensive fires, floods, earthquakes, landslides that I mentioned. And again, the key is that they are indiscriminately killing off a large segment of the population. Who survives? Yeah, it's the luckiest, just by chance. It has nothing to do with being the fittest. It has to do with being in the right place at the right time. So their surviving gene pool that we're talking about is going to be very different, and it will typically be much, much less diverse than the original population that we started with 
in the first place. So this schematic diagram kind of nicely shows that along the base, we have the size of the population going back in time, large population and a large genetic diversity as well. This is where the large die-off did take place. So that is our bottleneck effect. Population numbers again might go up once again, but not the genetic diversity. We still have low genetic diversity. So unfortunately, a number of the examples that I'm gonna show you here, what caused the bottleneck effect is not fires, floods, earthquakes, but it in fact is us, humans, homo sapiens through hunting or habitat destruction and that sort of thing. So this one here, the Northern Elephant Seals, and going back about 130 years, um, estimates are that they were down to a measly 20 individuals. Today, the numbers have rebounded up to about 30,000. But very, very low genetic diversity because of the small population size and all of the loss of those different versions of the genes, the different alleles, when this bottleneck did take place. A little bit closer to home, North American bison, kind of a similar story. And about the same time as well, 130 or so years ago, down to about 750. Now in North, North America, maybe up to about 350,000, but a huge amount of genetic variability lost. And perhaps even more extreme with the cheetah, down to um, maybe a handful of individuals with the bottleneck effect and a huge loss of the genetic variability. The next kind of genetic drift, this one here, the founder effect. So I already mentioned this one with one of the previous examples. So we'll take a look at a couple of pictures here. So the difference between the founder effect and the bottleneck effect is that with the founder effect, it's not a huge segment of the population that dies off. It's just a smaller segment of the population becomes removed from a larger population. That can be intentional, it can be non-intentional. It can be a storm that is taking these individuals here and separating them from the rest of the population. So now that group would become the, what we call the founding population, and that's why it's called the founder effect. It may also be intentional, for example, if we are talking about human populations, there might be individuals uh, going back in time within a population, within a tribe that decide that uh, they're going to consciously move away from the rest of the individuals or they might be kicked out from that population and they would then now give rise to this found, founder uh, population. So in this case here, it shows that we do have um, a lower number of individuals, of course. What it doesn't show in this picture is uh, the change in the variability within the population and the diversity within the population, but that's also going to be lost. So then what can happen though is just normal genetic drift. So the picture on the left, very similar to the one that we just saw, where we have only two different versions, so either the green or the red as it's shown here, gives us the initial distribution, equal distribution. But once we have a smaller population, again, strange things happen. So in the original, much, much, much larger population, we wouldn't expect this sort of change to take place. But when we have very, very small numbers, just small random events can lead to very rapid changes. So what we see here is that over the course of five generations, and again, it's not because whatever this red version is, is better suited to the environment. It just has to do with chance. For some reason, those are the individuals that were reproducing. Those are the ones that were passing their traits on. And what we see is that after five generations, we do have fixation of the red allele. That's the only one that remains. And the other one has been completely removed from this population. So the final one that I have here is gene flow. So now we have the physical transfer of individuals or alleles out of a population. And through the process of migration, uh, migration being transplanted into another population. So if we take a look at this image that we have here, going back and taking a look at the beetles again. So these are two different populations that we do have, members of the same species, so they could interbreed but they are, they are separated, they're different populations. So going back to the example of a storm, maybe it's a windstorm that separates this beetle from its population here, transplants it over into this population. So now what we have are new genotypes, new alleles that have been introduced into this population. So gene flow is always going to increase 
the genetic variability within a population. Whereas the previous ones that we saw, the founder effect and the bottleneck effect and even natural selection, all of those are going to decrease the variability within a population. Okay, so gene flow will always increase the variability. That doesn't necessarily mean that those are going to be beneficial genes. It's likely as well, or possible, that this beetle here could be bringing over genetic information alleles, which in fact are deleterious to those particular beetles within that population.